Hey, Maurice. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Good, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. I am so um, thankful for the uh, you giving us this opportunity to do this. Oh, no, this is great. I, uh, you know, I'm excited to hear about uh, all this work. I liked your introduction. Um, makes a makes a sound the book sound uh very exciting it's it's not out yet right it's coming out the 30th it just came oh, it, i have my i got my copy like two days ago oh, okay. so um so it's uh it it just came out um one of my uh, students was itching to to get it and said that uh he uh, amazon at least was saying it's not going to be available till the 30th and i uh and he said, is there any way I can get it? I, I really want to get it because I think it's relevant to the work I'm doing right now. And I said, I said, you know, not even the authors have this book yet. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> <a liar. laughs> no, no, you were you uh, uh, you were right up until like 48 hours ago. So uh, so, yeah, we hadn't even uh, gotten it. And and your student, I mean, actually, with the um, you know, there's a paper that's a paperback first came out in paperback that's and nice. so um um that's only 27 dollars. and so with the 40 percent discount wow it's really affordable that's great yeah yeah Jeez. so um so i'll post that you know early on and mm -hmm. i'll post it again when we get to um the q a i have my my script ready to go i have a little slideshow let's see have you made me co-host I made you a co-host, so see, you should be able to share screen, but if, I, I, I'm just going to let multiple participants share. That's fine. So that, so that uh, you know, the other presenters, if they have something. So I have this screen, um, uh, and um, yes, and um, I'll, I will stop uh, once we get to the other presenters. I'll stop sharing screen so that they can uh, get it. Do you want this up at first, or do you want me to wait until after you're done? No, you can keep that up at first. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It's, it's easier that way. Uh, you know, fewer transitions, better. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna try and be brief. I, I just uh, want to do three things. Uh, I just want to mentioned that the series is going to be continuing and I guess I'll uh, oh I have to wait to post my email in the chat but I'll post my email in the chat um, uh, in case anyone else wants to sign up for it uh, but but I just I just want to announce the upcoming events and tell them um, uh, how to ask questions because you said it, it's probably easiest for me I'll just call on people to, for the questions. Yeah, you can you can go ahead and, and uh, really I'm um, I'm pretty much after after our four uh, contributors say their piece I'm just gonna wrap up very briefly and then and then that's it you can take over from there for the whole Q and A mm -hmm. uh, you know and um, uh, we'll just see who the you know how that goes so yeah should be fun. okay. Okay, so yeah, so I'm just going to announce the upcoming events. I'm going to uh, tell people how to ask questions, and then I'm going to introduce you. It'll take three minutes, and then you and then you're up, and then you can take over until the question answer part. We uh, we will get started here. Welcome to everyone. It's great to have so many people joining us today. My name is Dan Angster. I'm a professor in the Hobby School of Public Affairs and the director of the Elizabeth E. Rockwell Center on Ethics and Leadership. Uh, at the University of Houston. Uh, for this, the latest installment of our Care Ethics uh, Zoom lecture series, we have several authors who are going to be talking about ch their chapters from Care Ethics in the Age of Precarity. I'm gonna momentarily turn things over to Maurice Hammington, who's gonna be our Master of Ceremonies today. Um, hmm, I think my chat uh, But first, just a couple of items of business. Uh, one is that this series will continue next semester. Our next event is scheduled for January 28th at noon central time. It'll be Carol Gilligan. She'll be talking about, I'm not sure exactly what, uh, either maybe her recent work on care ethics or maybe a, um, her, you know, how she sees her relationship to, to other care theorists, something like that. I don't know, I'm gonna talk to her later today about her topic, but that'll be uh, January 28th. Then later in the semester, we have Sarah Munawar and Rika Pratz 
scheduled and we might have a couple other presentations as well so so please uh stay tuned for that and if you are not yet on the um the list for notifications about these events you can email me and I'm, I'm trying to put my email into the chat but for some reason it's not working for me oh there it is yes okay i'm going to put my my uh email into the chat and just send me an, an email and just say add me and uh i will add you to the list and then you'll you'll get notifications about about all these upcoming zoom lectures and the registration links for those so second item of business, um, Maurice is going to be handling the presentations today. I will be handling the questions. If you have a question, uh, the easiest thing that I've found is for you to just uh, um, do, use the chat and just write question in the chat and, and then I'll call on you in the order uh, that you um, that, that you, uh, you designate if you have a question. Uh, so, so just use the chat function, please. If you if you have a question, just write question in that, and I'll call on you in order. Uh, and you can enter you can enter uh, um, the chat and, and question at any point. If you you know during the first presentation or second presentation, if you have a question, you can go ahead and do that. We'll wait till the end of all the presentations to do the questions, but but that will get you in line at least. And finally, I have the great pleasure of introducing our Master of Ceremonies today, Maurice Hammington. Uh, professor Hammington is a professor of philosophy and also an affiliate faculty member in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Portland State University. If you don't know him personally, uh, which you should, um, you should get to know him because he's a great guy, but you probably know him from his many books and articles. His books include Care Ethics and Poetry, Care Ethics and Political Theory, which I had the good fortune to edit with him, Applying Care Ethics to Business, Socializing Care, and many others, including, of course, uh, today's, uh, the subject of today's presentation, Care Ethics in the Age of Precarity. Uh, that, that's the right title now, right? Yes, Care Ethics yeah, in the okay. Age of Precarity. I mean, before it was Care Ethics and Precarity, uh, but I thought it had been added to Care Ethics in the Age of Precarity. Yeah. Uh, this, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. This. Uh, this is really a, a great topic. I think a great application of care ethics, um, an area of, of thinking that really needs to develop. So, I'm really excited to hear what uh, you all have to say about uh, your contributions to this volume. So let me get out of the way and pass things over to Professor Hamilton so he can get things started for us. Great. Thanks. Okay. So I'm. You're going to monitor the admit button because uh, it was kind of busy there uh, for a while. Uh, well, it's just wonderful uh, to see you all and welcome everybody. We have a mix of of uh, people, care theorists uh, and um, experts in the field, but also some of my colleagues at PSU have joined and um, uh, welcome all of you. Um, and um, I want to really thank uh, Dan Engster and the University of uh, Houston and the Hobby School. Uh, this is a wonderful service. Um, those of you who have been in on the series, you heard like the next speaker is Carol Gilligan, and and Dan was didn't know what he's going to speak is what she was going to talk about. And my thought is it doesn't matter. It's Carol Gilligan, so let's you know we just want to hear it. So um, this has been a fantastic um, service uh, for our community. And uh, we all owe uh, Dan a debt for, uh, for leading this. It's, uh, it, it's quite spectacular. Um, I also want to uh, welcome my, uh, my co-editor, uh, Michael Flower, who's Emeritus Professor of Interdisciplinary Science Studies at PSU and co-editor. Uh, Michael, why don't you wave your hand for right now? OK, so um, uh, he and I uh, both uh, uh, organized this book uh, together. Um, and uh, thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Um, in the chat, um, I am going to put the flyer for the 40% uh, uh, discount. Um, let's see, oh yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, and I'll do that again when we get to the question and answers. So um, this is a very affordable book. It was, uh, the paperback is like $27 and with a 40% discount, that's pretty uh, pretty uh, accessible, so that's uh, that's great. Um, so um, our schedule for today, let me get back to the PowerPoint. 
Uh, our schedule uh, today, uh, Dan Zori welcomed us. I'm, um, Michael and I are going to talk a little bit about the background of the project. Um, I'm going to have a brief tribute uh, to one of the contributors to the volume um, who unfortunately um, passed away from COVID before the actual publication. And then we'll hear from uh, four of our um, uh, chapter contributors, um, Eva Federkate, Sarah Clark Miller, Emily Dion, and Maggie Fitzgerald. Uh, I'll just wrap up uh, uh, very briefly and then we'll open it up to your uh, questions and uh, answers. Um, okay, um, now um, I'm gonna ask uh, Michael to unmute himself and um, talk a little bit about the genesis of this because this actually goes back to 2017, the idea uh, for, this, uh, for this book. Michael? Uh, thanks, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm glad to be amongst uh, folks who are ethicists. I'm trained as a developmental molecular biologist uh, who reads widely and hopefully uh, well. But uh, shortly after I retired, uh, Maurice became uh, director of university studies, which I've been a part of. We just began meeting to chat about all manner of things, care ethics, uh, the work of Bruno Latour, uh, neoliberalism and such. And uh, that led me to suggest we ought to teach a class. And uh, Maurice being more strategic said, no, actually we ought to have a faculty seminar because the ideas that we talk about will spread more widely that way. And uh, we did. Had about a dozen faculty who met over the course of eight weeks. I put up a website that a link to the readings we read, uh, uh, all sorts of folks, uh, Judith Butler, Guy Standing, uh, Wendy Brown, Chris Hedges, Nancy Frazier, some of Maurice's work, Neil Noddings, uh, Henry Giroux talking about neoliberalism in the academy. Uh, that uh, led to, well, was part of uh, the idea to sponsor a conference, which I had little to do with other than I don't have the connections for that. Uh, Maurice did. Uh, that was a grand success, I thought. Uh, yeah, and so the, yeah, we so we had this we had this faculty um, learning community uh, that lasted uh, for eight weeks, and part of the precarity there was um, we're a state school, not well, you know, not always the best funded. We had a lot of adjunct faculty working with us, and so we we talked about personal precarity, but then put it within our social uh, uh, system and looked at wider forces and uh, talked about it in terms of care. And uh, it, was, it was quite the engaging experience, uh, I, I, I think for us. And then we had um, uh, in, also um, in 2017, um, there was a meeting in the Netherlands uh, with the Care Ethics Research Consortium, an international group of researchers and scholars uh, who work on care ethics and care theory. And um, it was founded by Joan Toronto, who's here, and Carlo Leggett of the University of Humanistic Studies there. And um, as a group, we decided to have a conference uh, for the first time. And um, uh, uh, I somehow, I volunteered to host it at Portland State University. Um, it's funny how those things happen. And, um, in, and um, uh, in 2018, we had about 150 scholars uh, from all over the world um, join us uh, for this Care Ethics and Precarity uh, conference. Uh, Eva was our um, uh, keynote, uh, was one of our keynote speakers and um, you can see the program um, there, and we try to make it a very uh, art uh, artistic and engaging kind of uh, experience. The success of that program uh, led us to want to uh, write a book on this uh, subject and have some of the presenters develop their um, articles into chapters. Uh, and so um, that's, um, that's how we got the book. And um, now three years later, uh, the, the, the wheels of academia turn slowly. Three years later, uh, we, have, uh, we have this book and it's, uh, it contains um, 11 original um, 
uh, chapters um, and uh, in an introduction uh, and a conclusion uh, written by Michael and myself. Um, these are the chapters of the book, uh, in case you're thinking about uh, checking it out. Um, we originally wrote this um, prior to um, the pandemic. Uh, and so, um, you know, the word precarity and precarious has gotten a lot of play uh, from lots of uh, figures, Judith Butler uh, among them. And, um, uh, and so you know, we, we address those things and then the pandemic hits and you know, we have this kind of uh, reframing of, uh, of precarity or acceleration in some cases of precarity. And so then we write a conclusion that is um, kind of um, post, um, uh, post pan well, not post pandemic, during the pandemic uh, it was written and um, we address issues of, um, infrastructure, care as infrastructure uh, in, the, uh, in the conclusion. Um, and that's when I wish we had gotten this book out faster because then infrastructure became such a big topic in this, uh, you know, in this country. But, but Michael and I had been talking about it for quite some time. Uh, and um, uh, uh, so now it looks like we're, we, you know, we're a little late to the party, but we were talking about it way back then. And um, it's interesting that uh, we're having this book launch today uh, you know, given that the House just passed in the United States, the House just passed the uh, uh, the infrastructure bill. Of course, it still has to go to the Senate. But um, uh, uh, you know, in terms about thinking about systemic um, uh, care and what can be done collectively, uh, it's kind of an interesting uh, uh, moment. But we're uh, very proud of the international scholars who came together uh, for this. Uh, you know, a variety of kinds of articles. Um, some more theoretical than others, some uh, apply to particular um, contexts, but all of them addressing a pushback against neoliberalism. And that's what this book, you know, part of the, the impetus for this uh, and what Michael and I talked about way back in the, uh, the faculty learning community was um, not just precarity because human life is, 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 you know, is inherently precarious, but this kind of unnecessary precariousness that's added on uh, by a kind of a worldview um, that is that pushes um, uh, markets and competitiveness and uh, and profit uh, over the you know taking care of people and the well-being of people and how that that adds unnecessary precarity so that's it, it's that kind of differential that we were really uh, uh, concerned about. Um, interesting things like how um, we, we say we can't afford, you know, certain um, social support structures, uh, it, you know, in the United States, but somehow we managed to afford them for a period of time, you know, in the, in the, in the pandemic. And, uh, you know, why can't we continue um, uh, some of those things? So we're really looking at, um, uh, you know, um, how some of the narratives uh, in the world today have contributed to, uh, to human uh, uh, precarity. Um, and also, I mean, we're also concerned about environmental precarity as well. Okay. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's enough kind of an overview. Um, I want to um, now... Uh, um, talk a little bit um, ab about um, Elena Pulcini. So, um, whoops, need to go back. Um, we, um, uh, Elena came to our uh, conference in, in, in Portland um, in 2018, and um, she made a wonderful um, uh, presentation there, and we asked her to turn it into uh, a chapter, and she, she gladly uh, did so. And then in April of this year, we were heartbroken um, to learn uh, that she had died in Florence um, uh, at, at the young age of 71, really, um, from COVID. And um, this is a, a real loss. You know, uh, one of the leading uh, care ethicists, if not the leading care ethicists uh, in Italy, 
um, she was um, always uh, very generous uh, with her time, uh, you know, um, quick uh, to smile and laugh, but also provocative and pointing and, and would all and, and push people. Um, her book, uh, Care of the World, Fear, Responsibility, Justice in the Global Age, was translated into English um, and really kind of helped uh, um, connect her with um, a whole no a new audience uh, for her, uh, her fantastic work on care. Uh, the book uh, came out in, uh, in 2013 in the United States. Um, and, uh, and, that, and, and she's uh, written many um, articles and books uh, including she worked with Sophie Bor Borgo uh, of Canada on uh, uh, emotions uh, and care uh, in 2018, uh, an edited volume on the Peters Care Ethics series, uh, uh, which is a wonderful um, collection. Uh, and um, it was a, it, you know, it's a real um, loss uh, to the community. I think that the, her chapter in our book is probably one of the last things of hers to be published. Um, and she really believed in the project. I wanted to leave this tribute with some words from her that I wholeheartedly agree with. I think that care should become a way of life, a way of dealing with all the aspects of life from the private to the social to the political against the pathologies of the contemporary age, individualism, narcissism, indifference, violence. Care is a revolutionary word that can transform our vision of the world and our relationships with each other, as well as with nature and the environment. She was very concerned about intergenerational care. Um, and um, uh, we're, going, we're, going to, we're going to miss her. Uh, those, are, uh, those are beautiful sentiments. OK. Um, now um, I am uh, going to turn our attention uh, to, um, oh yeah, I'm going to end sharing actually, uh, stop, uh, stop sharing and, uh, turn our attention, uh, to some of the individual, um, chapters of this, of the book. Um, as I, uh, as we mentioned before, we're lucky enough to have four of the contributors here and, uh, very, um, happy to have Eva feder Kate, who I said was, um, uh, one of the keynotes at, at Portland State, Emeritus Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at, uh, at Stony Brook University. And um, she's gonna talk for a few moments about her chapter. Thank you, Maurice. That was a wonderful introduction. Uh, and uh, it's uh, certainly a very timely um, volume and I, I haven't seen it yet, but I will, I'm happy that it's out and I will see it soon. I'm going to uh, share my screen, which you probably already see, and uh, get the slideshow up. Okay. Um, I decided to um, investigate something that uh, I had been thinking about uh, before uh, Maurice invited me, and um, have to turn this off. <laughs> this happens all the time, <laughs> and then of course, uh, okay, okay, there we go. No more, I hope. <laughs> um, and um, I've been thinking about. Uh, the dis in disability. Um, the claim has been made by disability advocates uh, that uh, disability does not necessarily, can, but does not necessarily impinge on your ability uh, to have a good life and uh, have well being that is equal to the well being of people who. Uh, do not have a disability, or don't have a disability yet. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, which I entirely, <laughs> I entirely endorse, endorse that view. Um, 
So I've been thinking, what is the dis in the in disability? And um, I came to the conclusion that the dis in disability is the precariousness of the uh, hold on well-being uh, that uh, the disabled person has. So uh, it's not the quality of life per se, but the ability to hang on to that quality of life. The various, the many ways in which that the goodness of that life uh, can um, can vanish uh, or can be interrupted. Um, and so I was thinking about the question of precariousness, um, aside from, I know Judith Butler has been writing on it, but I, I was thinking about it in this context. And, um, and so uh, I was sort of challenged to think about uh, what's the relationship here between um, precarity and disability, uh, precarity, uh, precariousness, precarity, and disability. And um, it became uh, quite apparent to me uh, that the, uh, for some, uh, okay, um, it became quite apparent to me that part of the precariousness that comes with uh, disability um, is related to uh, the precarity of the care worker. And um, so in this paper, I try to work out what that relationship is and how the precariousness of a life with disability can slip into precarity uh, for a number of different reasons, um, but one of the central ones is the precarity of the uh, care worker. Um, the uh, condition of, liberal, of neoliberalism uh, aggravates the situation immensely because of the uh, retreat from public services, uh, which are vital uh, to people with uh, disabilities. And yet uh, there's a, a, a curious, um, oh, it's not a paradox, but there's a curious, curious conflict because some of the ideals that are embraced by the disability movement, uh, independence, productivity, self-reliance, um, are unfortunately in line with some of the ideology of uh, neoliberalism. Um, and some folks in the disability community have even said, uh, you know, we don't need to be taken care of, you know, uh, just uh, stop putting obstacles in our way. Um, well, that may work for some, but it doesn't work for a lot of people. And it looks like um, uh, some of the research has also indicated, and I'll, if I have time, I'll show you that slide, um, has indicated that uh, since the ADA, in fact, uh, the situation of poverty for people with disabilities has gotten worse, not better. Uh, now, I don't mean to say that the ADA isn't good and that disability rights aren't great uh, and uh, that the work that the disability community has done isn't um, very valuable. But there's a very unfortunate confluence um, that it, it takes place where uh, the, the uh, push of the neoliberal ideology and economics is to uh, take services away, um, leaving people who are trying to be independent without the supports that they need to be independent. So um, in the paper, I'll run it through it quickly if I can. Uh, the first thing I, I, I do try to uh, make a case for is that 
um, that uh, disability is uh, not a life with less well-being, but a life with more precariousness than most. And you might ask, doesn't the precariousness itself make that life um, have less well-being in it? And I say, no. In fact, some of the things that we have in our lives that we want to add to our lives, we want to add things to our life that enrich our life, that make our happiness more precarious. Just think of having, you know, if you have a child, uh, your happiness is suddenly much more precarious. Right? But that doesn't mean that your life is less good because you have a child. So uh, that's the, the first uh, issue that um, I try to uh, bring forward. Um, and um, one of the important distinctions, I think, because between precariousness and precarity is that precarity involves insecurity. Um, we are all precarious, our lives are all precarious, but we move on um, in the supposition uh, that the floor isn't going to fall out be 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 beneath us as we walk. Uh, we've got uh, that we're not going to fall off a cliff uh, as we uh, take take a walk on a, a mountain. Um, and uh, so as long as we have some sense of security, uh, that precariousness uh, doesn't necessarily turn into precarity. So precarity really has to do with the insecurity that one is facing, especially around economic issues, but also one can add social and political issues. So the, uh, the precarity of people with disabilities um, slips in, the precariousness of people with disabilities can become Precar um, uh, can turn into precarity for a number of reasons. One is just the medical conditions that accompany many disabilities. Um, the other is a withdrawal of services. Um, and, and here is where some of the paradox comes. Uh, to the extent that disability rights are attached to the values that are promulgated and vaunted within the liberal, but especially neoliberal society. The realization of these rights, which unfortunately is uh, rarely full, it's usually partial, uh, can present still more precarity for disabled people. And um, so I give the example of maneuvering a wheelchair up and down curves. Now this makes it wonderful. You can move around in a wheelchair uh, but then you go out and, and, and you try to do your things, uh, go to work, uh, right, um, using your wheelchair. But then you come across a street <laughs> where they don't have curb cuffs. Uh, and suddenly everything falls apart, you know, something very small like that. But it's the uh, inconsistent uh, realization of these rights uh, that can uh, very much uh, turn uh, the precariousness uh, of disability into precarity. Um, this is the uh, point I wanted to make earlier about the gap that has widened in 25 years since the landmark uh, with uh, the uh, uh, Disabilities Act was, invented, it was enacted. And you might ask, how could that possibly be? Um, well, <clears throat> For one thing, um, disability is dealt with in the United States in two different ways in a policy uh, uh, context. Uh, one is the ADA, the other is uh, SSI and SSDI, Social Security Insurance and Social Security Disability Insurance. And these are absolutely at loggerheads. Uh, the ADA is, to, is supposed to uh, give you accommodation so that you will be able to be in the workforce. The SSI and SSDI insurance uh, limit the amount of income you can have in order for you to get those uh, uh, get that assistance. So these are uh, ways in which these two 
uh, views of disability are enacted in our, our legal and policy system. Uh, but uh, the way in which um, I, I give one example, I, I don't know what my time is here. I, I, Eva, um, if you wouldn't mind wrapping up in a minute or so. Okay, so, so the, the, the most important way in which people with disabilities uh, become uh, uh, the precariousness slips into precarity is in terms of the precarity that uh, care workers experience. And care workers are the quintessential uh, precariat. Uh, um, globalization has added to it, but prior to globalization, uh, all the kinds of insecurities uh, that um, Guy Stanting, uh, Standing, for example, talks about um, of members of the precariat are features of the uh, lives of care workers. That precarity, of course, we've seen this written writ large in, in, the co in the time of COVID. But when you don't have a care worker who can come to you uh, to your house to dress you and get you up and do the things you need to do. Um, your, not only your independence is at stake, but your lives are at stake. Um, disability, people with disabilities have suffered far more uh, deaths in COVID uh, proportionately. Um, and even without COVID, uh, as, as when service, when um, funds are taken out of uh, programs that give, for example, personal assistance to people with disabilities, um, people with disabilities are really left hanging uh, and their lives become lives of precarity, uh, poorer in economic terms and uh, poorer in quality generally. So the argument in the end <laughs> is that we need Mm. that unless we have a system of justice that's designed to take dependency seriously, and that's a system of justice in which embodies an ethics of care, the already precariousness, of, uh, precarious well-being of disabled people will be that much more precarious by the increasing precarity that caregivers face in a neoliberal economy and ideology of self-reliance. And uh, COVID is QED. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, uh, Eva. Uh, Eva has, of course, um, you know, pioneered uh, the uh, work in, in care ethics and, um, and uh, disability studies um, and uh, uh, very uh, important figure um, in the care ethics community. Would you mind um, stop sharing your uh, screen? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now we'll turn to um, Sarah Clark uh, Miller, Associate Professor of Philosophy, Bioethics, and Women, Genders, and Sexuality Studies at uh, Penn State University. Thank you so much, Maurice. So Maurice, I have to note, I timed it, and I'm, I think I'm going to go for 11 0.25 minutes, if you will permit me the extra minute and a quarter. <laughs> You've got 11.25 minutes, go for it. <laughs> thank you. So I wanna first um, thank Maurice and thank Michael for uh, for creating such an amazing volume um, and thank Dan for organizing this series. I have to say it's been a real lifeline to come here and gather and see so many faces who were quite important to me during times that have been tough. So Dan, that's a tremendous service you've provided. Um, I'm delighted to be part of such a timely volume um, and to be positioned alongside uh, so many scholars I, I deeply, deeply admire. So I'm going to read my comments today, which I don't usually do, but 10 minutes, well, 11.25 minutes is a short period of time. And if, if I read, I'll be more precise and be able to get uh, more of my argument in. So the, um, the article that I contributed to this volume is entitled Neoliberalism, Moral Precarity and the Crisis of Care. And so in this article, 
I begin by acknowledging that neoliberalism has long been on a collision course with care. This is something that scholars from a wide array of disciplines um, have acknowledged, and they've considered how caretaking practices and policies have been negatively affected under neoliberal principles and institutions. Um, so the contribution I aim to make is to argue that two aspects of this crisis require greater attention. First, what I call the moral precarity of caregivers, and second, the relational harms um, that take place under neoliberal capitalism. So let me really uh, set a quick background in terms of neoliberal principles and policies and then just dive into these two, uh, two contributions I, I hope I make. So we know that neoliberal principles and institutions impinge upon individual flourishing in, in many serious ways, including increased poverty, exploitation, illness, and general inequality. For the vast majority of people, existence in a neoliberal context is marked by a heightened sense of vulnerability and dependency, which they're at increased risk, um, uh, which means they're at, increased, they're at increased risk in a variety of ways. In a neoliberal world, getting one's basic needs met is increasingly tough. In essence, neoliberalism fails to countenance the type of beings that care ethicists have long recognized us to be, ones born into serious and abiding dependency, ones with needs, ones who in short require care throughout the entirety of their lives. So I think one characteristic commonly associated with neoliberalism is, of course, the precarity it produces. And I think many of us here know um, Judith Butler's work on this topic, where she concerns sort of uh, is concerned with the distri distribution of precarity um, across different populations. So that's also an important background for um, for my paper. This picture that of general neoliberalism and that Butler paints um, it's a picture of hazards of neoliberalism. I think it's fairly familiar to us. I argue that it's incomplete in two significant ways, right? So it fails to consider, as I said, both moral precarity, specifically of caregivers, and how our relationships understood as um, morally significant entities over and apart from the individuals who comprise those relationships, how you know, neoliberalism kind of increases the precarity of those relationships. So let me first tell you about moral precarity. One insufficiently theorized aspect of neoliberalism's hazards concerns the moral precarity that caregivers often endure. Moral precarity arises in circumstances where fulfilling the responsibilities one takes to be central to their sense of identity proves circumstantially impossible without also incurring considerable and unavoidable harm. When experiencing moral precarity, it becomes increasingly difficult and ultimately unfeasible to adhere to the ethical principles that comprise the core of one's integrity. One place to begin in order to understand the sense of moral precarity is with the everyday experiences of those attempting to engage in caretaking practices in the midst of free market capitalism. Caregivers experience the crisis of care, I think, in very personal and intense ways. Neoliberalism makes caring for those we love, I mean, frankly, just very, very difficult. Caring for others within the framework of late capitalism is peppered with impossible choices. And as we scramble to meet others' needs in the face of multiple obstacles, it can make caring for ourselves outright impossible. So I think, you know, if we, if we consider the daily existence of caregivers um, under neoliberalism, their moral precarity might, well, might be well represented by a sense of incessant pressure. Beyond exhaustion and burnout, what caregivers risk losing when they endure forms of moral injury under neoliberalism is their ability to uphold their own sense of morality, the core beliefs that make them who they are. This amounts to the risk of losing their very sense of identity as caring individuals. And this really is the heart of moral precarity. So I'll gloss over this part um, to make sure I maintain my, my time limit. But basically, at the core of care ethics, we find a series of responsibilities um, that have to do with human needs and vulnerability and dependency. If you understand yourself to be a carer, you're going to understand yourself to have a responsibility to protect those for whom you care in accordance with their vulnerabilities to injury and harm, as well as a responsibility to support them in their dependency by meeting their needs. This is exactly what we can't do as carers often um, during neoliberalism. Okay, that's moral precarity for caregivers. Relational harm is the second main component that, um, that I offer in, in my contribution to the volume. So I note that in addition to the ways in which neoliberalism impairs individuals, 
the broader populations of which they are members and the systems in which they exist, neoliberalism also endangers a vital source of human connection, positioned, I think, between individual and structural levels, namely relationships and the relational. So neoliberalism heightens the already, always already existing precariousness of relationships. In jeopardizing relationships, neoliberalism will subject not only people, but their intimate connections with others to injury and instability, which can ultimately push those relationships to the breaking point of rupture. Moreover, I think the very conditions of cultivating relationships arguably shift under neoliberalism, capital, neoliberal capitalism's political logic of radical individual, uh, individuality, yielding a broader context in which the moral value of relationships can be undermined and occluded or in which there is an inability to value relationships in a non-instrumental way in the first place. So what I argue here is that there are two key forms of relational harm that happen um, in conjunction with caregiving and neoliberalism. Intrapersonal harm, so ways in which our relationship with ourselves will be harmed, and then intrapersonal harm or relationships between people. So on the intrapersonal front, um, here's, I think, the good way to characterize it. So an illuminating way to discern what happens when caregivers suffer from moral precarity is to examine how it impacts the way in which they relate to themselves. When caregivers are un unable to uphold moral principles of importance to them in caring for others under the pressures of neoliberalism, they sustain harm to their intrapersonal relationships. This harm, I think, can take multiple forms. In the face of the disintegration of their moral integrity, a sense of distrust in their own moral abilities of agents and agency can arise. So if you understand yourself to be guided by a, a practice or principle of care and you fail repeatedly to uphold that principle, you may come to question your own moral commitments. If this happens while locked into a neoliberal ethical perspective of personal or individual responsibility, you may fail to apportion appropriate causal responsibility for this failure to the economic and political system in which you find yourself. Instead, basically, you believe that you can't carry out the moral commitments that are most dear to you. Um, this, of course, can further uh, damage your self of respect, your sense of self, uh, your sense of self respect. Um, and uh, I think it, it can amount to a violation of something like a duty to self. That's the intrapersonal front. On the interpersonal front, um, we can see how neoliberalism can disrupt the relate the relationships caregivers hold with those for whom they care, right? So those connections can become so frayed that they ultimately break. They're unable to sustain the stress that late capitalism inflicts upon us as individuals and upon us as collectives. The fraying results not only from the caregiver's experience of not being able to care well for others, but also from the caregiver, the care recipient's experience of not being well cared for. When you possess needs that are someone else's to meet, be they a matter of duty or love or both, and they repeatedly fail to meet those needs or fail to do so lovingly and with respect, even if their failures occur for reasons you know are beyond their control, the bond you share can begin to fracture. When care negligence occurs over time, that relational bond can crumble beyond repair. The destruction of such relationships is the collateral damage of the economic gains neoliberalism delivers to a relatively small minority. In calculating the sum total of neoliberal uh, capitalism's damages, the harms our relationships sustain should count just as much as the harms that we incur as individuals. So the final thing I'll say um, is to offer sort of one additional step uh, in analysis of the relationship between uh, care and neoliberalism. Um, and I'll also sum up. So the precarity that neoliberalism engenders affects whether we understand ourselves to be decent, caring people, capable of upholding our own moral code. It affects the degree of self-trust and self-respect present in our own in, uh, interpersonal, intrapersonal relationships. And it affects the strength and sustainability of our most cherished interpersonal relationships. Before finishing up today though, I wanna note that there's a final relational repercussion of neoliberalism that's uh, worth reckoning with. All fo the forms, three forms of moral precarity coalesce to produce an overarching relational precarity evident in the ways in which neoliberalism gener uh, generates relational vulnerability, instability, and unpredictability. So why does this matter? When a relational precarity is felt and experienced on a wide enough scale, and perhaps especially when the precarity of caring relationships in a crisis of care 
results in a larger sense and a larger reality of relational precarity. This can challenge, uh, this produces challenging and potentially disastrous outcomes that I think can result um, in, in difficulties for mechanisms of social reproduction, right? So our webs of relationality, which I think have always been much more fragile than we perhaps care to realize can start to tear. As the fabric and the web of relationality give way, institutions that are undergirded by uh, cooperative sociality, the economy, political institutions, and ultimately aspects of culture are going to be jeopardized. This will threaten the social contract itself. So this is why I think exploration of the moral precarities of neoliberalism deserve our careful attention and while, why the moral precarity of the crisis of care is so deeply consequential. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, uh, Sarah. I think uh, if, uh, if you're thinking about uh, the question and answer period, you might um, go ahead and start you know, putting questions in the, in the chat. Um, we're already seeing a little bit of a theme here with Eva and Sarah's uh, presentation on the relationship between the caregiver uh, and the one cared for uh, and the significance of that. Uh, our next uh, chapter contributor is uh, Emily Dion, social political scientist, feminist thinker, and qualitative health researcher at the Vidim Research Center in Sustainable Health in Quebec. And she teaches sociology at the University of Laval. So uh, welcome, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, uh, for your participation today and your invitation as well. It's been really a pleasure to uh, participate in the 2017 conference and to, to meet a lot of uh, the, new, uh, the new people with whom I've been thinking now in the past few years and, uh, and, and just be, have been a contributor to this book as well. And uh, as others have, been, have said as well, it's just um, uh, so uh, so healing as well to be participating to uh, these these uh, very needed conversation. Um, so in my in my chapter, I propose to bring a series of, of feminist and queer literature and philosophy that I thought um, I thought did not converse sufficiently with one another with regard to care ethics and the ethical response to to things such as uh, advanced capitalism and neoliberalism. And so with this idea of neoliberal uh, times, uh, sorry. Um, so this idea as well that uh, in neoliberal times and with this concept of in the age of precarity, uh, I think what we wanted to convey is that we live in, in tremendously complex times, but also times that keeps um, complexifying as well, uh, uh, exponentially and, uh, and constantly. So we're, we're connected, we're hyper-connected, which intensifies, uh, intensifies possibilities and capacity, but it also intensifies vulnerabilities, it creates new ones. And um, one of the things that I will explore together, like what that I explore uh, in my chapter and that I'm, I'm bringing to you today is that how these two things actually probably go in hand in hand, right? This intensification of possibilities, but also the intensifications of vulnerabilities. Um, and and so, of course, like many of you here today in care ethics as well, right, we abide by um, this idea of an ontology of vulnerability, right? We talk a lot about this relational concept, uh, conception of, of ontology, um, which is present care ethics, but also uh, differently in these other contributions that I explore in my chapter that has to do with feminists and queer new materials and feminists and um, queer science and technology studies. Um, and so basically what I, what I propose in my chapter was how in weaving these, these uh, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say two literature, but really there's more than them two, um, but what they, they give us the, are conceptual and practical tools to understand precarity and precar precarization in the old liberal times um, in the sense of, of how it changes us at so many levels, but also at these, corporal, bi biological, and sensible ways um, as people, as people who can, and as people who care as well, um, who, and when I say people who care, I also mean people who receive and, and provide care. Um, so in my chapter, what I did is, is bring the contribution of authors of precarity, such as Judith Butler and Isabel Lorre, um, uh, who talks about governmental precarization, and also some of those um, uh, feminist and queer new materialist thinkers, such as Donna Haraway, Karen Barad, Elizabeth Wilson, and, and um, Maria Puig de la Bella Casa. Uh, so on one hand, uh, the work of, of Butler and, and Lorre is specifically uh, 
located on those concepts of, of precariousness, precarity, performativity, um, embodiment as well. And they, they, they make use a lot of Foucault's concept of governmentality, biopolitics, um, and, uh, and materialization as well. And so their, their contribution really helps us to, uh, to, to distinguish, right? Like with Butler's foundation, foundational and in kind of uh, providing us these two concepts of precariousness and precarity. Um, and I think the two presentations before explained it, uh, explained it well, so I won't dwell too much in, in that, but this idea that, uh, that in a certain sense, we can talk about what is, uh, what is uh, um, uh, an ontological, but also a latent a, a vir virtual condition of precariousness, precari uh, precarious ontology. And with precarity, what we have is a, a re, ordering of, of precariousness, a kind of actualization of some, some precariousness that doesn't need to be actualized, it doesn't need to be active, um, uh, but that, that basically the social ordering uh, contributes to, to, to make it more precarious, some, uh, make it more uh, yeah, precarious certain forms of, of precariousness and, and also valuing and undervaluing other forms as well. And, and here specifically, when I, when I talk about uh, this ordering of precarity, what I, what I always think is, is useful is to recall this concept of the real, uh, where it comes from, right? Uh, how the, 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 the word real comes from royal, which literally means, you know, the royalty, the king. So when we talk, when we use this concept of the real, uh, I always find it very useful to remember how it, it literally means the eye of the king and what the king could see. Um, what the king would see, what, what wanted to see was the real and the, the rest does not exist. Um, and in that, in that action of seeing and not seeing and, and deciding not to see, well, it has material effect, it changes how things matter in this, uh, in this material and, and discursive way uh, where the material and the discursive are always um, entangled. And so um, working with those concepts, I then introduce uh, those of Isabel Lore, who uh, adds a third concept to Butler's uh, two concepts of precariousness and precarity, and she talks about governmental uh, precarization. Um, and so Isabel Lore is, is uh, famous for her work on um, her field work um, with cultural worker, and she examined uh, how cultural workers would embrace uh, uh, seemingly wholeheartedly uh, precarious forms of, of labor. And so this, this, in, this complex way in which creativity and the, the kind of flexibility uh, that seemed to go hand in hand with certain certain forms of labor that actually were also uh, precarious forms that are precarious forms of la la um, labor in an advanced capitalist um, uh, regime, right? Um, where because these type of um, these type of, of work work structure or work organization uh, do not fit the the more traditional model, you you can you you can kind of um, uh, remove some of those social benefits that we get attached with certain position, right? Like when you're contract work, when you're doing contract work, right? So Isabel Lowry um, looked at at this phenomenon where the cultural workers uh, would kind of see it to their to the benefit of of their creativity, something that their creativity needed, these that flexibility that comes with certain forms of labor, and would fully embrace uh, forms of labor that actually were also curious. Um, and in, in so doing, she, she showed how, um, well, the, the, in, in a sense, the two get conf conflated, but also confused, right? Because the, 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 the flexibility that comes with certain things that these forms of, of, of labor offer have other costs, right? Where, for example, like if it's uh, for, like the, the, the fact that you're not com compartmentalizing your aspects of your life, that work can kind of happen anytime also means that work will happen anytime, right? Um, and so the, 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 the boundaries that allows you to rest or that allows you to have these, these, these um, times when you're away from work, basically, well, that's these, um, these collapse and, and work invade all other places of, of your life. And, Underlying also this desire to take on these forms of labor, Isabel Lorre is talking about how this notion of the uh, of, of the narrow liberal self, as well of the able-bodied, uh, of the, the the independent person, the the person who can be plugged on all these different. Um, 
you know, tools that we have now, and the, in particularly in the digital era that we cease to see um, in the different ways in which they actually make us vulnerable. I think that in the, 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 the ecological crisis that we're seeing today, we are uh, becoming much more aware of, of how we are vulnerable in so many ways and dependent on, on these different types of, of uh, technology. Um, Okay, am, am I okay on time? I just I'm just hearing a microphone. I just wanted to make sure. Do it over here before I realize. I feel like when I do that. You have a couple of minutes. Somebody has a somebody has okay. their their uh, phone on. I mean their speaker on or something. Okay, okay. perfect. Thank you. I'm sorry for the interruption. Um, and so. So the, the idea is that um, because there is this um, kind of the the. Um, the, the, the illusion, I guess, the illusoriness uh, the, of the figure of the, the, the neoliberal figure uh, is very present, right, in the cultural worker that Laurie is examining. There is an, it's kind of a, a, a dream or an, a, a perception that the, the way in which uh, the person is at a given time, space, age in their, her, in their life as well will kind of be maintained throughout uh, throughout times, right? So there's kind of this disconnect between how um, how we are uh, pre precarious uh, at, at this ontological level and how we are transient uh, beings as well, and in course and, and relational, and um, and you know we can we can develop a chronic illness or we can um, uh, we can also develop stress and anxiety, and these forms of labor would actually intensify and, and create that. Right, um, and so this concept of, of governmental precarization for Laurie is very important because it's not just talking about um, what it does to one person, one group of person as well. It's it's basically creates a wheel of of precariousness, a precarity inducing behavior, whereas like whereby I adopt certain forms of labor and and uh, and desire certain forms of of labor. Well, those forms of labor becomes also in intensified, and um, and I I can contribute in these ways to the precarity of of uh, others as well. And I really like what um, Eva was talking about when she talked about precarity and insecurity. And this links to the, the final comment I wanna make that has to do with um, the contribution of, of feminist new materialism specifically here. Um, is that when we, when we see the way in which precarity is creating and intensifying insecurity, what happens is that um, co corporally and sensibly we become uh, we, be, we, we develop this sense of fear and insecurity, um, whereby we, we cease to become available to others as well and cease, cease to be um, in touch as well with that uh, kind of vulnerable potential that we have, right? Like because we are vulnerable at an ontological level, this is how things happen. This is how we connect with, with others. This is how we, we uh, grow relationally with others and other things and, and, and otherwise as well. Like that, that very potential is, is, is to, um, to that vulnerability. But when the vulnerability itself ontologically um, matters only through precarity and insecurity, well, then we're, we're creating each uh, each uh, for ourselves, this sense of unavailability. And so, uh, again, like I'm taking a little bit too much time, but the contribution with feminist materialism is to pay attention to that to that materiality and and and, and um, that corporal and sensible configuration that through um, precarity gets created, where we just become unavailable um, and cannot uh, cannot connect as well with uh, with one and one another. Um, and the 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 contribution uh, that, that I'm adding today as well in terms of of, uh, of uh, where um, where we can where, where we can go in terms of, of deal, you know just accepting these type of concept and, and and confronting the fact that we are living in an age where this um, sensible disposition is constantly uh, tr like transformed into indisposition and on the uh, on the availability as well. Um, my proposal is to do that through different forms of storying, right? Storing with others and storing with the otherwise. Um, and I think that like new materialism and, and the science and technology studies are particularly helpful to help us think about these different ways in which we can start um, storying and creating other 
other uh, other narratives as well, um, and 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 basically we. Uh, rekindle and recultivate different forms of sensibility and availabilities to the other. So I'll stop here um, and I'm very excited for the discussion period. And again, thank you very much for uh, the uh, invitation today and the um, possibility to contribute uh, my uh, what I'm trying to do in this chapter with you today. Thanks so much, uh, Emily. Uh, you're one of the uh, kind of um, a uh, new generation of scholars in this field is really pushing uh, care ethics in uh, to new um, uh, ways of thinking. Another uh, who is doing so is uh, Maggie Fitzgerald, our next uh, contributor. Uh, she's assistant professor in the Department of Political Studies at the University of, Sk uh, University of Saskatchewan, uh, where I understand there's two feet of snow right now. Yes, yes, winter has come. Um, Thank you everyone for being here today uh, to our hosts for having us. Thank you to Maurice and Michael for their careful work ushering this volume. Um, it's really a pleasure to be a part of it. I could probably spend, I think, the next 10 minutes just articulating how wonderful it's been to hear from my fellow presenters and to see where their papers have gone since I first heard them in 2018. Um, but I'm cognizant of the time, so I'm going to jump right into uh, a brief overview of my contribution to the volume and to the ways in which I've been thinking about care and precarity. So recently, there's a, a growing literature on multiple ways of being in and seeing the world described by the language of the pluriverse or by the term political ontology. Uh, and that term comes from anthropologist Maria Blazer in particular. This literature illuminates not only the different ontologies that exist globally, but also the political processes through which these ways of being come into conflict um, and in many ways co-constitute each other. That is, starting from the idea that ontologies perform themselves into worlds through collective knowledges and practices, this idea of political ontology asserts that instead of one world with different cultures or social groups or paradigms, there are in fact multiple unique worlds which are constantly enacted and brought into existence. At the same time, these worlds are of course tied together in and through various relations of power and because of our shared material being. These differences and, and connections and the paradox between those also can lead to conflict. So to illustrate, consider an example that I explore in more detail in my chapter. In March, 2017, the local Maori tribe of Wanganui in the North Island of New Zealand won recognition for the Wanganui River as their ancestor, meaning it must be treated as a living entity, it was essentially given legal personhood. This river was granted this recognition after 140 years of struggle by the Wanganui Iwi. Under this new status, the New Zealand legal system sees no differentiation between harming the river and harming the tribe because they are one and the same. Um, there's a saying that the Maori have in New Zealand that I am the river, the river is me. So this case I suggest is an example of a political conflict between two worlds. On the one hand, the New Zealand government, constituted by sort of the neoliberal modern world, constructs and understands the river as property. On the other hand, the Maori tribe of Wanganui understands and knows the river as an ancestor and still living kin. However, the current relations between these worlds are such that the neoliberal modern world is the dominant world and has, through various relations of power, been able to assert its own ontoepistemology as the whole of what is real. In so doing, neoliberal modernity determines what is thinkable, knowable, or speakable. Consequently, the Maori world was rendered unintelligible for over 140 years. The river was not viewed by the state as kin or as a living entity, but rather was treated as property. Indeed, even the Wanganui Iwi's own view of the river as kin was not acknowledged by the state. As a result, the reproduction of the Maori world was undermined as the river was both treated in a way that violated the logic of their world and denied a subject status that is key to their broader ontological and epistemological framework. The 140 year struggle to recognize the river as a living entity then is an example of a conflict between worlds. It is political and it is ontological. Indeed, I believe that this idea of political ontology and of multiple connected yet distinct worlds presents a more expansive political landscape as compared to mainstream notions of the global. 
As the just described example attests, the notion of multiple worlds does not simply ground the political in competing interests, viewpoints, or goals, but rather locates politics as the very processes through which different worlding practices conflict, shape each other in often contradictory and complex ways, and create the very boundaries of what is knowable and speakable. The purpose of my chapter in this edited volume is to begin to explore how care ethics might allow us to better understand the nature of political ontology as this robust site of politics. In particular, I argue that care ethics, with its emphasis on mutual vulnerability, provides a useful orientation from which to contemplate this political landscape of multiple worlds. Starting from a feminist relational moral ontology, the ethics of care emphasizes that vulnerability is an inherent ontological condition of subjects who are embedded in relations of dependency. Um, and I think my fellow pa panelists have spoken to this point as well, of course. Um, because we are embedded in and constituted by relations, we are inherently vulnerable, susceptible to others, to social systems, to the context we find ourselves in, to relations of power. We are indeed co-constituted by both personal and broader social relations and are thus always open to affecting and being affected. This is vulnerability. However, as Kelly Oliver argues, conceiving of ethics as premised on shared vulnerability is limited because it does not recognize that social and political conditions and relations of power render some more vulnerable than others. Um, and Emily, I think was talking about this, about the real, you know. To help overcome this limitation, in this chapter, I put forth a conceptual distinction between vulnerability and precarity, whereby precarity is, in, is enhanced or in, intensified vulnerability, resulting from unequal distributions of power that render certain subjects more vulnerable than others. So in this way, I see uh, vulnerability is a necessary but not sufficient condition for precarity. And again, I think the, the themes uh, across the panelists here can be drawn quite clearly uh, with this point. So with this distinction in mind, my main assertion in this chapter is twofold. First, I make the broader ontological claim that all worlds are inherently vulnerable and contingent given the relations that tie worlds together, given the fact that they need to be enacted through practices, knowledge practices, um, discourse, and so on. At the same time, in the global political economy, certain worlds are rendered precarious, more vulnerable, through relations of power. Thus, while the ethics of care orients us towards the inherent vulnerability of all worlds, a lens of precarity allows us to then consider the explicit effects of global material and ideational hierarchies of power on worlds, as well as on the relations between worlds. These concepts I suggest are particularly useful because a significant analytical challenge related to the study of political ontology revolves around understanding which worlds are rendered precarious and then explaining how and why they are marginalized in this way. It is here that I think the ethics of care when combined with the distinction between vulnerability and precarity can make a contribution. As care ethics emphasizes all subjects are vulnerable and as just noted, this claim I believe can be applied to worlds more broadly given that they are relationally tied. By foregrounding the mutual vulnerability of all worlds, care ethics reminds us that the hierarchy of political ontology the ways in which worlds are tied together in a hierarchical way is in fact contingent. The relations between worlds are necessarily unstable, open to change and vulnerable. In, foreground, in foregrounding this contingency of the hierarchy, a care ethics lens also creates space for a critique of the current configuration of the ways in which worlds are ordered. If all worlds are inherently vulnerable, why do we give credence to some and not others? Why are certain worlds relegated to the margins of the global political economy? Why must some worlds struggle to reproduce while others dominate, while others can claim the whole of the real? While this opening is an important first step, I contend that we also then need a lens of precarity to answer these questions, to investigate the material practices and relations of power that render certain worlds more vulnerable, that is precarious than others. Thus, my hope is that the distinction I develop between vulnerability and precarity in this chapter bolsters both the literature on political ontology and the ethics of care in a mutually constructive way. A critical and political ethics of care must pay attention to the ways in which vulnerable subjects, and of particular import from my concern here, vulnerable worlds, are not equally vulnerable. 
Care ethics has to pay attention to relations of power, which render certain worlds more vulnerable, that is precarious than others. At the same time, the distinction between vulnerable and precarious worlds facilitates a more robust political ethics of care by foregrounding not simply vulnerabilities at the interpersonal or material level, but rather the ways in which vulnerabilities and relations of power which shape vulnerability into precarity also operate at a fundamental ontological and epistemological level in the context of multiple enacted worlds that are distinct yet intertwined. Given that the ethics of care has been presented correctly, I believe, as a political ethic, attending to the political implications of this landscape of multiple worlds is a pressing task for care ethicists, particularly if we are committed to decolonizing our social relations, to thinking about how sort of neoliberal modern practices create a hierarchy amongst worlds. My hope is that this chapter, and specifically this conceptual distinction between vulnerability and precarity presented just now, provides one fruitful opening for the ethics of care to begin to grapple more fully with the political ontological implications of multiple worlds. Thank you. Excellent. I have to do what Sarah did and read because 10 minutes is tight. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it is very tight. And uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Maggie. Um, you know, a few years ago, uh, a philosopher friend of mine who's not part of this uh, community said to me, are you still doing um, care ethics? Wasn't that something, you know, like from the 1990s or something? And I, uh, and this, I, I think um, the people in this book and the presentations you've seen today, see why this is such a, a, a dynamic uh, field. We are not uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're fleshing out care and the relation itself, but we're also, you know, bringing in ontology and epistemology and, um, uh, and, and, and really um, uh, kind of shaking the basis uh, of things um, all together as we, uh, you know, through these explorations. So there's just so much exciting work. And I think um, we, we see that exemplified amongst the presenters here. Let's, let's all give, let's give them all the presenters a, uh, uh, a hand um, here um, uh, and thank them. Um, unfortunately, Sarah Clark Miller had to leave uh, for another pressing uh, matter. Um, but if you wanna know more about any of the presentations, uh, read the book, because uh, the, the, the chapters will be there. Um, I am now going to um, turn things over to Dan for uh, the question and answers, and I will put in the chat one more time the uh, the discount flyer if anybody wants to get forty percent off uh, uh, on the uh, on the book. Um, okay, take it away, Dan. All right. Well, thank you all for those excellent presentations. That was very um, thought provoking for me. I really enjoyed all that. We have a couple, uh, we have a comment and then a question in the chat. And uh, please, if you have questions, now's the time to, to just indicate in the chat that you'd like to ask a question or I'll call on you. I'm gonna start with uh, Monique Lenoir, who uh, says she has a comment about home health care aids. Hi, okay, thank you. And thank you to all the speaker. Hello, Emily. <laughs> It's been a long time. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I have a project that will be starting, it's a four-year project here in Canada called Bridging the Ethical Gaps, Healthcare Aids, Ethics, and Provision of Home Care. The title comes from the Bridging the Gaps, comes from uh, Christophe de Jour, uh, who's a French writer who's written about the psychodynamics of uh, work. And if you're familiar with Pascal Molinier and her work on, on care, uh, she uses that framework. So basically what we're going to do is interview um, home care aides uh, in, from two non, uh, well, nonprofits, uh, one in Hamilton and, and one in Ottawa. But in speaking to the um, I guess the people in charge at Thrive, which is the Hamilton one, they were telling us how they have different levels of care. So low acuity, high acuity, and also uh, support to families. And it'll be interesting to see what ethical dilemmas um, kind of come out of that. And uh, the project aims 
to really understand the vulnerability, the, the ethical or the moral vulnerability, as Sarah was talking about, um, and through a situational vulnerability lens. So using um, Mackenzie Rogers and Dodds about that. The other one too, that is really important for us will be that of epistemic justice or injustice. So I think what's going to happen, well, who knows, um, is that we'll see these different kinds of dilemmas appear. And what's really, what we're really focused on is to understand how the care aids solve these things. And in part, finally, um, Dezul and the psychodynamics of work really emphasize how workers should work in teams and discuss. And we'll see how that's not really available, or maybe it is for home health care aids. I know Thrive said to us they want the aids to feel as part of the family. Now, is that good or bad? We'll see. Anyway, so that was just what I wanted to say. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, does anyone want to comment on that? No. <laughs> uh, can I, I might just say very, very quickly. Uh, thank you, Monique, for your uh, your comment. And we really need to chat because I have a lot of project on the go right now. That anyway, I think we could collaborate on some things. But I, I like what you're saying about about teamwork and group work. And I think that like reflecting about the condition that allows that or 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 prevents that are really key. And one of the things I didn't say at the end of my presentation is that I really do think that um, neoliberal time and this idea of precarization and this the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial self is just intensifying this idea that like, we need to isolate ourselves, we need to be individuals, right? And we, we can achieve everything by ourselves and just by plugging each other on on things but I but I think that like this is this social imaginary it needs to be broken away and that we can that that um, not burden, but that weight uh, is just unbearable at a human level. And we are supposed to be social and, and working team as well, right? Anyway, so that's all I wanted to, to add. Eva? Yeah, uh, about um, uh, being a member of the family rather than being um, having support from a team. Um, I, I think it's very, uh, it, it, it's very problematic uh, to say that the caregiver is a member of the family. Um, it's too easy to uh, in, do the same kind of exploitation <laughs> of the care worker that's done with familial caregivers. Um, and, and it also vitiates uh, the world that the caregiver lives in. The caregiver has their family. Um, we who uh, employ a caregiver are not their family. Um, so I'm very suspicious of that kind of talk. And I think uh, the, the idea of working in teams and having team support is a uh, it's such an important idea. All right, thank you. Nancy Hirschman, uh, are you still here? Yes, there you are, good. Hi, hi. So thanks everyone for um, really great presentations. Um, you know, Emily mentioned as well as the last questioner mentioned the term vulnerability. And I was wondering if any of the panelists have done any, sorry, sun's sh uh, streaming in here, um, have done any work with uh, the vulnerability theory project of Martha Feynman's and, and what you think of that and how that fits into um, this whole whole thing, particularly disability, uh, Eva. Martha keeps saying, oh, you're really talking about vulnerability theory. And I'm like, I still don't sure that I understand how she constructs it. So if you have any insights, that'd be great. But I also want to talk about your talk in your, your paper in specific specifically, because as you were talking, I realized that you helped me recognize what problem, one of my problems with the social model, which is how highly individualistic it is. It says, oh, if we just redesigned the society, you know, uh, pre persons with disabilities could be just as individualistic and just as self-sufficient as non-disabled people. 
And, you know, you want to say, no, nobody is self-sufficient. The whole point is to understand the interconnectedness of everybody. Um, and so I think your way of going about approaching this is really, um, is really very helpful. Um, so I wanted to uh, just applaud you. That wasn't a, a question so much, unless you had any, any further uh, comments uh, in response to those thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid I used to be involved in Martha Feynman's um, vulnerability, but I, I, I sort of dropped out. Um, don't know why, I just did. Um, I, I think um, I think not everything should be characterized as vulnerability, uh, or at least there should be distinctions made between the kinds of vulnerability there are. Um, so I keep insisting on talking about dependency and dependence um, because I think that's a particular kind of relationship that human beings have toward one another. Um, and of course, uh, it's about our vulnerability, but it's not only about our vulnerability, it's also about our attachments and uh, our attachments already come with precariousness. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, uh, actually that leads me to something I wanted to say about, uh, if I may, uh, to Emile's paper, which uh, all the, first of all, I, I didn't get to thank everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean to thank everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Dan and Maurice and Michael, for, for this uh, wonderful occasion and uh, for all the work that you've done. And, uh, and uh, thank you to all the contributors. I can't wait to read the volume. Um, but um, I want to say... Um, I want to uh, think about the embrace of precarious work by the cultural worker. Um, I, I think that is, in fact, a very good example of how we had uh, adding precariousness to our lives is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> uh, in fact, it can be part of enriching our life. And the problem, at, the problem is when precarity is the cost uh, of uh, embracing that kind of precarious work. Um, so that, you know, artists are left uh, to be starving artists. And, um, and uh, the, uh, and, and have to give it up because they can't, they can't maintain themselves, um, so we we need to we may need to uh, understand that precariousness itself. Uh, uh, yes, it's an ontological feature of human life. I don't think all people are equally precarious. I think when you're when you have a disability, you are more precarious. You you live life more precariously. Um, uh, but uh, it's the it's the insecurity and it's the economic costs uh, and the emotional costs of precarity that are are problematic. You, Maggie, you want to get in there, then Emily next. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just want to say I think this is a point sort of worth dwelling, dwelling on that the risk of foregrounding one's vulnerability, the risk of it, is not evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. That if we're thinking politically and strategically, it is, you know, it is, I think about this in, in terms, the critical disability movement taught me this, but also indigenous movements to reproduce their worlds have taught me this. Mm -hmm. um, the modern world, you know, my world, we need to understand that we are vulnerable. This is part of our problem. The, the sort of liberal, uh, independent, individualist, uh, real world that we've enacted is, is not an accurate reflection of, of how worlds work, of how individuals work, of how you know, being in the world is. We need to, I think, foreground it, but it's very not, it's not very risky for us to do so because that we currently have such a, a hold on the real. Um, it's a different risk for, for people who are positioned differently, who are marginalized, who are struggling to reproduce their worlds. 
Um, but at the same time, I do hold on to vulnerability as this sort of fundamental claim that we are all vulnerable um, for two reasons. One is that um, I, I think it's only by doing so that we can sort of begin to critique modernity and then this myth of independence um, and look at why, you know, Professor Tronto talks about who gets a pass from care. Um, I, I want to look at who has a pass from understanding their own vulnerability. I think that's important. Um, but also there's power in vulnerability resiliency only makes sense in relation to being vulnerable for example you you would you know that word would mean nothing if you were invincible um and so i think thinking about vulnerability in this deep relational way can also help us trace the ways in which there's a power there i think that the maori world's continual reproduction is powerful in its confrontation with modernity in that it reminds us that what we think is you know, real is not the whole of that's real for different forms of moral life. Um, and that's quite powerful. So I, I think sort of trying to hold those two things in tension, but certainly this, yeah, the notion that there's a, an unequal distribution of riskiness in our assertions of vulnerability is very important. And I think we should be attuned to that. So thank you for bringing that up. Yes, thank you. Emily? Thank you, Maggie. And, and thank you for uh, the question. Um, so, Thinking back again again about this contribution that Laurie brings with the cultural worker and, I, and linking it back to the, this idea of advanced capitalism and neoliberal times, I think I think some of the kind of this this uh, thing we need to reckon with is that um, as we're, you know we're we're never just individual like in, we never just make individual decisions uh, actions that only involve us right like who is this us and as an individual like like I think Butler said it well when she said that, you know, like my body is my body and it's not my body. And I think that in the age of digital <laughs> big data, people are confronted to this idea all the time that it's like basically their data is not their data. It says so many things about other people and other groups of people as well. And we're confronted all the time with this impossibility of the individualism, um, individual at the same time that we are constantly being told that you are an individual and it's just that's our imaginary right that's uh, we, we 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 think and continue to perform the individual on a daily basis right and with the cultural worker what's interesting is that in the in neoliberal time is that these things such as the flexibility that you may want with your work right the the, the idea that like you don't want to separate work and, and and life right that these things need to could, could grow together, that this vulnerability can be creative. Well, it gets recuperated in, in these ways that just come and bite you behind, from behind and make you precarious and affect your health and affect your ability to, to live and live well and survive in, in, uh, in these times, right? Um, so I just wanted to perhaps add, add this and uh, I, I don't really know well the the work of of uh, Marta Feynman, so I, I couldn't really talk a lot about about that. But I do like I think with the concept of vulnerability, from when the work of Katriona McKenzie, for example, and and you know the the this this the, the book these 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 thoughts that um, are done in, in philosophy. So if that could be uh, helpful as well. Thank you. If, if, uh, Maurice, can I just come back? The thing about Martha, what, what I find intriguing about Martha's work is that um, uh, uh, resilience is always built into this notion of theory that we're all vulnerable, but we have unequal dimension, we have unequal resources of resilience, access to resilience. And that's then where I start to lose it because I'm always reading it through, you know, some sort of a fundamental Western quasi individualistic. Um, you know, understanding of relationships. And that's what I was, I was hoping that um, some of you might um, have had familiar with, familiarity with, but I'd love it to see if, if you guys should check out her website and some of her readings, some of her writings. Um, and if you can crack the code, I'd love to have you share it with me. Because <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking about it with her for years and I'm still a little puzzled, so. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, so we have unfortunately come to the end of our, our time together. Uh, this is, of course, only the beginning of the conversation. It's the book. Um, Maurice tells me was just out 48 hours ago at 
that arrived. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the final word, Maurice, but I just want to thank everyone for coming. And I hope I'll see you all on January 28th for our next session. And I'll send out a reminder again, if, if you're not on our mailing list and you'd like to be, you can uh, email me at d-a-e-n-g-s-t-e at central.uh.edu and you'll get notifications of future events. And then let me pass it to you, Maurice. I'm, I'm just very appreciative uh, to everybody. It's, um, uh, you know, it's a long haul to uh, get an academic project uh, done and it's, it's always wonderful to hold the tangible um, artifact in your hand. Um, this is, as, as you can see in the world, this is such important work and it's thrilling to see all of you and how you're thinking about this. And um, as Dan said, the conversation will continue. I put my email in the chat a little while ago and I'm happy to continue conversations with, uh, with any of you as we, uh, uh, as we go forward. But um, everyone uh, take care. Yeah, congratulations on the book. Great job, you all. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, everyone take care of yourself. See you in a couple months. Bye. Thank you.